At the outset, may I thank the uh, President and the Council of the Association of Minimal Access and Digital Surgeons of Sri Lanka for initiating this program. And uh, as part of this uh, educational program, I'm expected to share with you my thoughts with regards to certain aspects of a very common operation, namely laparoscopic cholecystectomy. In the history of general surgery, perhaps no other single general surgical procedure has had such an impact as has the introduction of laparoscopic cholecystectomy. In fact, this operation took the world by surprise. With it came a string of complications. And since 1970s, surgeons who are very enthusiastic in learning new things have learned a lot of lessons from this evolution. So the objective of what I'm going to tell you today is a form of commentary of what I learned about this particular operation, but specifically how to perform a safe laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Now, first thing I want to tell you is that we talk about laparoscopic cholecystectomy. I will divide this into two segments, three segments in fact. One is a decision making of how and when to do the procedure. Secondly, the basic principles of the operative steps of laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Thirdly, what is meant by difficult laparoscopic cholecystectomy and how you would get involved in making decision making component as well as the technical component. So these are the three areas which I will touch upon. And what I'm going to tell you is not what is in the textbook only, but it is based on my experience of doing laparoscopic cholecystectomy since 1998, I think. Now, basically, we all know the indications of laparoscopic cholecystectomy, but these indications have evolved over time. When I started doing lap colis in Columbus South Teaching Hospital, Acute cholecystitis was generally considered as a contraindication for surgery, contraindication for laparoscopic cholecystitis. Now it is actually an indication. So you can see the way in which the things have evolved. But those details you can actually learn from the book. So I will talk about the first the decision making and how to plan your patient for surgery to start with and then get on with this basic and then get on with the difficulty. Now, when the patient comes to you for a lap cole, we popularly call, patient thinks that it's a much simpler operation as compared to the conventional open cholecystectomy. Now, it's very important that you speak to the patient with clarity in a language which that particular patient could understand. Now, a patient coming from a Padavia, the Total language should be different to a patient coming from Columbus 7, naturally. Basically, it's the same operation, but the way we go there is different. That is a basic point you want to highlight, but in a language which the patient can understand. Otherwise, when you, when the patient wakes up and suddenly the patient finds that he got an incision on the tummy, they, would have, they will always interpret that something has gone wrong and you have done a wrong, different operation. However much you explain after this, it's not going to help you even for educated person. So it's worth spending a bit of time on this. That is number one. So it's the same operation, but the, the way in which we go there is different. So that's a very basic point, but sometimes we surgeons, because we are very busy, we tend to forget this, and then we try to, number one. Number two is that when you look at the liver profile, and I think everyone who's undergoing laparoscopic cholecystectomy, liver profile is a very important investigation, because if you find a raised alkaline phosphatase in particular, uh, of course, together with ASD and ALT, but mainly alkaline phosphatase, 
And if it tallies with the history of some sort of biliary obstruction, which may be or may not be due to a stone in the bile duct, then one has to be a little bit careful. Because uh, in Sri Lanka, as you all know, most of the time we don't do operative cholangiograms. Only few centers will do it. But I'm talking to whenever you get your first appointment in the periphery, most of the time you may not be doing that. So if you are not planning for operative cholangiogram, I mean, I think some surgeons don't generally do it. I don't do it because we have the ERC facility available in Columbus South those days and now in the private sector. But if you are not planning for a operative cholangiogram, then the raised alkaline phosphorase together with the history, I think it is important to understand this. And if it's anything below 500 or maybe 300 or something like that, but no history suggests your cholangitis or obstructive jaundice in the history, which means fear with chills and all the jaundice, et cetera, that I don't have to go into the, the details. I think it's important to tell the patient that we are going to remove your stones with the gallbladder, but if the gallbladder has multiple small stones, a chance there is a possibility that stone might have uh, gone into the, the bile duct, and most of the time when you take the gallbladder out, the flow will increase in the bile duct and that stone will flush out, but occasionally it can get stuck in the bottom, which means that there is a very small theoretical possibility that you might get another attack. Don't get panicked about it, we can sort it out. Because one week after that, if there was a stone hanging around the bile duct and the stone comes and gets, blocks the lower end of the bile duct and patient gets exactly the same biliary colic due to a stone get, getting stuck in the ampulla, patient will think that you have not done the job because it's the same biliary colic he will get from the, bile, the stone which gets stuck at the spiral well at the, the uh, junction between the cystic duct and the gallbladder. So it, that message has to be transmitted so that the patient knows that there is something else surgeon told me before surgery that this might happen, but that's not the end of the world. It's nothing wrong with the operation. It's that we, there is uh, other minimal invasive or, you know, method of sorting it out. So I think that's also important. So two points. One is to tell the patient about the nature of the operation. Secondly, if there is any doubt about a marginal change in the liver profile, just to give a hint about the possibility of another recolic after and not to get panicked about. But third important clinical point, which a lot of people may not recognize as important, is if you are planning for laparoscopic cholecystectomy for a hot gallbladder, as you know, it's acute cholecystitis patient. Now, it's very important when you take the history, the actual date of onset of that particular attack. Now, if you feel the textbooks, if you read the textbooks or write-ups on the indications for laparoscopic cholecystitis in, in, in acute cholecystitis, generally most of the research studies would talk about 72 hours and beyond which it gets more and more difficult as you know because of the inflammation, gets into fibrosis and gets stuck to the liver, and gets stuck to the common hepatic duct and all that issues and one has to be careful. But it is very important for you to work this out by knowing when did that patient develop the, the episode? The patient will say, bother with you And you will have to ask, when did it start? How did it start? What happened to that from that particular point? And make sure that you understood the date. So if you are planning for lab cole after that, supposing if it's gone one week after the, from the, the timing of the first attack, not that you can't do it, you need certain amount of expertise for that, but I will go into that technical part in the, uh, the, when I said the last one, when I discussed the difficult cholecystectomy component. So this history taking, especially in hot gallbladders, when did the patient develop the pain followed by pyorexia, unwellness, and tenderness, and how many days that patient has had that. Scan might be very useful, but don't depend only on the scan. You'll be surprised as the time goes by, the moment you put the scope, you might find totally different. And in general, I can tell you that the scans, which has mentioned a lot of other difficult situations, you go in and you find that it's easy. And sometimes scan just says multiple gallstones, no pericholecystitis, no, no the, the fluid in the subhepatic space. You go in and find that the whole thing is total mess because duodenum and the omentum. 
and the transverse colon is totally stuck to the ball bladder. So don't only get carried away. The point is don't get carried away with the ultrasound scan. Clinical story is much more important. Right. <clears throat> Let me uh, get into the technical part of the surgery of a principles of lap colon. Now the whole objective is to get the gallbladder out with the stones and send that patient home. Now in UK, if we do the operation in the morning at 5 o'clock, they all go home. In Sri Lanka, we sometimes we keep them overnight because of the, the follow-up issues. So basically, it should be as clear as that. We say that when you go to see the patient in the morning, if the patient is seated outside in a chair reading a storybook or a newspaper, that patient can go home. If the patient is lying down in agony and holding the tummy, there is something wrong somewhere. That's very important as the time goes by as a senior surgeon. We will come at that. Now let me go into the technical part. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about the, the carbon dioxide, the intra-abdominal pressure. That, of course, is a late. You will learn all that. Let me go into the technical part. Once the patient goes to sleep, once you create the carbon dioxide and peritoneum, your objective should be for you to be very comfortable in this procedure. Now, most of the time in Sri Lankan settings, I think almost 95% of the people will do the North American system, that is, you, uh, the, 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 sorry, uh, European system, where, the North American system, where you stand on the, the, the left side of the patient operating. That's the standard thing most of the people do. There was a time where people used to stand in between the legs and do it, but I think most of the time people stand on the left side. Now, remember that you will put your subumbilical port, that will give you an idea about what's going on. But the positioning of your dissecting ports, working ports, what are the working ports? Your mid-clavicular port and the epigastric port. These are the two ports. And every patient's body stature is different. Subcostal margin may be, may be wide or narrow. Liver might be high in a cirrhotic, especially the contracted liver. And the gallbladder position is so variable because gallbladder is organ which can be very variable in position. So once you visualize the gallbladder, what I personally do is elevate the head end to the extent that the anesthetist is comfortable, not very high because you have to con be conscious about anesthetic issues, blood pressure comes down when you lift too much. I know the obstetricians lift very high sometimes but or very low depending on what you want but safety wise I think it's important to be conscious about what the anesthetist is doing as well without ignoring that and then turn the patient to the right. With that position, you might be able to see the gallbladder in most circumstances. I'm talking about the easy gallbladder, or standard gallbladder, not a difficult one. I'll talk about the difficult one later. Once you see the gallbladder, what I, I think it's, it differs from a surgeon to surgeon, but when I see the gallbladder, what I do is I put the most lateral port, that is the anterior axial line port. Although we call it anterior axial line, there is no hard and fast rule. The, the port which is fairly close to the gallbladder, as lateral as possible, you have to remember that your mid clavicular port approximately is the one which is your dissecting port. So I put that, grasp the fundus of the gallbladder and push the gallbladder over the liver if possible, may not be in most of the patients, in some patients. Now, now he, you have to remember that when you elevate the head end of the patient, the liver falls and liver is heavy. When you push the gallbladder upwards, that means you're pushing against the resistance and that gives you the actual static position of your gallbladder. That is a static position. It's not mobile now because you have fixed it. Because liver is weighing downwards and you are pushing upwards your assistant, then gallbladder is static. Now that is the position which you are planning to operate. Now you have to remember that with that particular moment, you are actually to some extent close in the callous triangle. You push in the gallbladder up means you are close in the callous triangle. So you have to be conscious. Of course, you know that your mid clavicular port, where your dissecting port, when you grasp the Hartman's pouch and retract inferiorly and laterally, you open the callous triangle. That's, of course, you know. I don't have to tell you that. So be conscious about it. That's all I say. Now, that means that your working ports, that is the epigastric port and the mid clavicular port, has to be in a comfortable zone for your, your wrist, your elbow, and your shoulder. And most of the experienced surgeons, this happens automatically. But when you're starting your career, it's worth to be conscious about it. Otherwise, you'll be, towards the end of the operation, you'll be having ache in the elbow and the, or the ache in the shoulder. 
So you just position yourself and see whether this is comfortable, and you know that, and then you push it and see whether you can get the access to the, 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 the Hartman's pouch, because otherwise you'll be going too medially or too laterally, or too listerly. So it has to be comfortable. Too, it shouldn't be too medial, it shouldn't be too lateral, it shouldn't be too distal, especially in obese patients. So that be conscious about it. The, it's very important that you be conscious about it and do this, otherwise the moment you put the port, you have a, some people have inhibition of change in the port. Then you'll be struggling right throughout between the epigastric and this one operating, and there is crisscrossing of this thing. So that's the positioning of the pose. Now, once you do that, of, uh, of course, at this stage of your career, you have done all this. You know that. I'm just recollecting your thoughts. Now, once you do that, the safest position to initiate the operation is on the inferolateral part of the gallbladder peritoneum. You know that, inferolateral part of the gallbladder peritoneum, which means that you grasp the, the Hartman's pouch, you retract laterally and inferiorly, check what's going on. Most of the time, that first few, you may see a bit of momentum, then you gently uh, get that momentum down. Don't peel it off because the momentum is stuck to the liver. You might tear the capsule and it starts bleeding, so be conscious about this, and momentum also can have vessels. Be conscious about diatomizing and getting it down. So. Remember, laparoscopic cholecystectomy is called a narrow field operation, whereas colectomy type of right and left femicolomy, they are wide field operations. So because it's a narrow field operation, once you position your patient headed up and to the right, and you can visualize the gallbladder region, it's a narrow field. Remember, your duodenum, duodenum is there, your fundus, your pylorus of the stomach is there, your hepatic flexure is there and your small bowel is there, they are not sometimes seen because you are looking at the narrow field. So if you are not conscious and having a chat with your assistant and doing this operation, and when you use the diatomy and it springs, and momentarily the tip of the diatomy, temperature of the tip of the diatomy is 1000 centigrade, extremely high temperature. And it might momentarily touch your small bowel or the transverse colon or the hepatic flex. It has happened to many people. So be conscious about that part of the operation because it's a narrow field operation. Your transverse colon might be very close, or the hepatic flexion in particular, and you may not see it. And if the spring effect of the, the, the diatomy with the tip, with a temperature of so high, might just touch it, and later ischemic necrosis might appear in a few days' time, and you may not know. So the, not that it's going to happen, but be conscious about it. Now, <clears throat> so going back on the technical part of the operation, you lift the fundus, you lift the Hartman's pouch, and you make an incision on the posterior peritoneum. Now, different gallbladders are different. Sometimes it might be pretty easy. Don't get carried away with the easy gallbladder. Easy gallbladder is a dangerous one, because you, you create a mindset that this is going to be easy. So you, all the actions are going to be easy type, till you either hit a blood vessel, or you pull the, the gallbladder and angulate the the bile duct to that extent that it might look like a cystic duct. So be wary of the easy gallbladder. And a lot of people, experienced surgeons have got into trouble when they do the easy gallbladder, not the difficult gallbladder. So that's another point to remember. So once you divide the posterior peritoneum inferolaterally and you get a space there, then you visualize the anterior. Now anteriorly, most of the time in my practice, you can actually recognize the lymph node of lung. You can see that node sometimes. And it is my practice, I make a small incision with the diatomy, just lateral to the lymph node of lung, not medial on to the lateral of the lymph node. And you divide the peritoneum there. Now then, slowly, whether you continue with the posterior, posterior lateral dissection or anterior medial dissection will depend on the particular case. But it should be safe. But when you are doing the anteromedial dissection, you have to remember that this particular lymph node might be seated on your cystic duct. If there is a caterpillar hump of the right hepatic artery, you might be uh, hepatic artery, you might be uh, right hepatic artery, you might be uh, then lymph node might be sitting on that either way. So be conscious that you ha you have not seen the cystic artery at that stage. It should be in the back of your mind. And also, the, when you see the lymph node, especially the lymph, lymph node is big. There are blood vessels to lymph nodes. So they can cause troublesome bleeding and you diatomize it, you might be diatomizing something underneath, which you don't know. So be conscious and be a little slow on that. 
And once you get this thing, especially the posterior lateral dissection, that mobilizes gallbladder and get the gallbladder a little looser. So your traction can, from time to time, can help you to visualize anteromedial a little bit better. Now, when you do that, when you go on pulling it, there is what is called cognitive illusion. Cognitive illusion means you try to make up your mind about what you see. Now, when you apply the traction to the uh, inferolateral part of the gallbladder, that is the Hartman pouch laterally, and you pull the gallbladder laterally, you can, you can see the continuation of the gallbladder into a duct, which you will obviously perceive as a cystic duct. And you jump and think that that is a cystic duct. It might be the cystic duct. Most of the time, it is a cystic duct. But depending on how much you are applying traction, if it is a loose gallbladder and a small bile duct, you can angle it. It might be the continuation of cystic duct, a short cystic duct, continuing to the bile duct. If it's a short bile, a small diameter bile duct. So be always conscious about it and think that that possibility is there. Cognitive illusion means that you make up your mind that this is a cystic duct. Don't make an assumption that it's a cystic duct till you make sure that you have demonstrated the infundibulo cystic duct junction convincingly. I repeat this point. Till you demonstrate the infundibulo cystic duct junction, which is a junction between the cystic duct and the gallbladder, convincingly, circumferentially, you must never make up your mind that it is a gallbladder. Sometimes you can see the bar duct, it makes life easy, but sometimes you may not be able to. <clears throat> and the second point is that even once you get that circumferential access to the infundibular cystic junction, even after you get in the circumferential control over the infundibular cystic junction, in my practice, I will not still clip that duct. I still think that it might be the bar duct. Not that I think, I will get rid of my cognitive illusion that that's a cystic duct. The best way of demonstrating that, gently continuing the discussion, medially and laterally, one at a time, trying to recognize the artery, controlling the artery with two clips proximally and one clip laterally, dividing that to get more space, making sure that it's not the hepatic artery because you can see the, you must remember that cystic artery might be the main cystic artery or right the, uh, the posterior branch and the anterior branch. So you might divide one artery and thinking that you have got the cystic artery, but suddenly when you try to dissect further down, you will find that there is another artery, that's the posterior branch, which you have to be conscious about it. But you have to make sure that it's not the uh, right hepatic artery because you have to demonstrate before you divide in that artery that it is ending up in the gallbladder, that of course you know. But the point I'm trying to tell you is that demonstrating and getting the control of the infundibular cystic jun junction in itself is not sufficient. It is very important that on the posteromedial part of the gallbladder, that is a continuation of the cystic duct along to the posteromedial part of the gallbladder, you must be able to demonstrate at least one third distance. So inferior you have demonstrated infundibular cystic jun junction, inferior you have demonstrated that it's a continuation of the gallbladder, but that is not sufficient. Anteriorly, anteromedially, you have to demonstrate the infundibular cystic junction, but most importantly, at least one third of the dis distance of the anteromedial part of the gallbladder, you must demonstrate that it is in continuation. And the other technical point is, when you do that, you, you do that while applying traction to your Hartman's pouch laterally and inferiorly. Always have the practice of taking that lamp off first. Drop the gallbladder. Let your junior doctor, uh, uh, let your junior doctor uh, relax your the, uh, traction on the, on the fundus of the gallbladder. Get the normal anatomical position and see, am I bending the bile duct? Am I dealing with a long cystic duct? Am I dealing with a short cystic duct? Now, till you get all that information, don't have this cognitive illusion and thinking that that's a cystic duct and clamp and divide. Once you divide, you can't do much about it. So it's important that you get all that information before you make up your mind to do the first irreversible step in this operation, which is the division of the bile duct. 
All surgeons will always tell you, all the textbooks will tell you, if the cystic duct is wide, you always imagine that it is a narrow bile duct, until proved otherwise. The senior surgeons would tell you, and it's very well described in the books also, that if you see a duct which is in continuity with the gallbladder, inferiorly, and also anteriorly, but it's quite wide, you always think that it is not the cystic duct, it's a narrow bile duct, until you prove that it is a cystic duct. Don't clamp it till you prove that. Be very wary of it. It might turn out to be a bile duct. In fact, Last week or week before last, I had exactly the same position and I have done extens extensive dissection superomedially, uh, almost onto the fundus and applying the traction and all that. S still I want to be, at even my stage, I want to be absolutely sure. Bhavanta was operating on the other side, I called Bhavanta and say, what do you think? And after Bhavanta also agrees that it's a cystic duct, only I clamped it because it's a very, very bile duct. They're big cystic duct. I think spiral value they are completely gone, wide by cystic duct, that patient has a recurrent attack before as well. So that is the type of patient. If you don't jump and say that, no, I've done thousands, I can do all that. It doesn't work like that in uh, safe surgery. You have to be very wary of it. Things are going wrong is very much less if you are a bit paranoid about this particular point. Okay. Now once you demonstrate that, then you are happy that this is the in front of the cystic duct junction. This is inferior continuity from the gallbladder to the cystic duct. This is a supramedial continuity of the gallbladder to the, uh, the cystic duct. And I have demonstrated the one third distance and convincingly that this is the in front of the cystic duct junction and it is not the bile duct. Now, remember in the open era, open surgery era, we always try to demonstrate the junction between the cystic duct and the gall bile duct. In laparoscopic era, we try to demonstrate the junction between the cystic duct and the gallbladder. You know that. But you don't have to dissect right onto the bile duct. But be wary, especially if the patient with adhesions, especially the Hartman's mouth immediately getting stuck there, you have to be very conscious that the bile duct might be close by. So be very paranoid about it, and then you will never go wrong like that. So once you demonstrate that, of course, you will be clipping the cystic duct medially, at least two clips. I, in my practice, most of the time I put three clips. The last clip is to sleep night nicely. The other two is for the patient. And the, the, the lateral clip on the gallbladder and I divide. And then once you do that, I find that most of the time, now you, you would have noticed that I didn't talk about this hepatocystic triangle, this triangle of safety. It is all in the textbook. You know all that. You know that this is a triangle, this is a callous triangle, you know that only one structure can cross it, that's a hepatic artery, the cystic artery, and it can have anterior and positive line. You all know that. I don't have to go into that. I'm talking about the technical part of surgery. Don't get upset about it. Now, once you mobilize that, then of course elevation. Now, if you have demonstrated the superomedial part at least one third or one fourth, two thirds, part of the gall body is finished now because you have decided. Now, after that, always try to dissect laterally before you do the dissect medially more. Because when you dissect laterally and lift it up, life becomes a bit easier. Now, when you are dividing, dissecting medially, in some patients, and I'm sure you would have seen it most of the time, the Hartman's pouch may, might be a little bit retracted towards the common hepatic duct area. So the way I do that is, once you mobilize well laterally, I normally put my uh, dissecting forceps, uh, actually the grasping forceps, uh, which are the forceps which I use it to, uh, to uh, grasp the, in front, the, the, the uh, Hartman's pouch. I take it out from there. I put it in that space in the superomedial area and just open it up. And that gives you a nice area. We know that bile duct is not there. You know that bile duct might be going down. And more than that, you see the margin of the gallbladder beautifully on the supramedial there. And gently you can touch the gallbladder area and go upwards. Posterior, anterior, posterior, anterior. Taking the, the, the grasp out of the 
in front of the, the Hartman spout and putting into that space and opening again. That traction will keep the tissue under tension. And you can generally go along the medial border of the gallbladder upwards. Once you get that mobilization, then the rest is easy. So once you, other common thing at once some stage of your career is you get carried away once you lift the gallbladder up. Don't get carried away because you can make a hole in the gallbladder. Especially if the patients have stones in the heart, the stones in the fundus, that area is usually stuck. So be slow there because by making a hole and making bile into the the, the, the liver bed, you will take another extra 15 minutes out of the operation. Be a little slow, slowly, laterally, medial, laterally, medial, slowly. If you see blood, that means you're going in the wrong plane. That is, you're going into the liver at some stage, especially at the edge. So be conscious about that. And once you remove that, of course, I think extraction of the gallbladder, I don't have to go into the detail. Now, what I described all this time is uh, how to perform a safe laparoscopic cholecystic in a patient with symptomatic gallstone disease, but without any major problems. So simple laparoscopic cholecystectomy the tricks of the trade, how to perform safely. Now, the next part of the discussion, I will go into what we, the textbook, or what you would consider as a difficult laparoscopic cholecystic. Now, the first thing to tell you is that this so-called difficult laparoscopic cholecystic means your perception. If you perceive that this is easy, then the whole story changes. So I think it's important that that decision making is going to be difficult. How do we make that decision? Well, in practice, this is how it is. Let me not talk about cancers. I will talk about patients. Let me not talk about the gangrenous gallbladder. I will concentrate on a patient who's either having acute cholecystitis or who just had acute cholecystitis a few days ago. Now, you can go ahead with the laparoscopic cholecystectomy after three days of the onset of the, the acute cholecystitis. Fourth, fifth, sixth. Maybe seven days or beyond seven days. Not that you can't do it, but be conscious about the, the, the percentage difficulty which you will be anticipating in respect to other scans. That's number one. So be conscious that you might be heading for a difficult goal bar. So I will now describe how, what you see, how you get yourself ready for that. Once you put the telescope, you will find that you can't, in some instances, you can't see the goal bar. Because, of course, momentum is a policeman of the abdomen. He goes and wraps around everything. And with the momentum, transverse colon and the hepatic pressure might be there. But if you ask me the structure which I am most dreaded is the duodenal. Duodenal injury in laparoscopic colic system, I'll tell you, is a disaster. More than colon, it, it's a duodenum. Duodenum, if you make a big hole in the duodenum, there is a possibility that that patient may not survive. So be paranoid about the duodenum. So in acute cholecystitis, in a patient with a high duodenum, it might be stuck to this area. So once you recognize that environment is a little bit tiger territory type, again, position yourself, lift the head up, turn the patient well to the right, position your ports, uh, and see whether you can gently, I repeat this word gently, because in acute cholecystitis, these tissues are inflamed. And the moment you touch the momentum, it will bleed. And that will spoil the whole thing. Gently see whether you can see where the gallbladder is. And most of the time, you might be able to recognize the gallbladder. Once you recognize the gallbladder, most of the time, it is difficult for a grasping force, which is the most lateral port, to grasp the gallbladder. Now, in that situation, Try once or twice. If it's difficult, don't go on trying it because it will tear it or got into problem. Remember in acute cholecystitis, this pseudo capsule. Actually, there is a little bit, fairly big thickening, maybe about five, five millimeters, as much as maybe even one centimeter before uh, around the gallbladder wall. So it will not hold. 
And the second reason is that most of the time acute cholecystitis occur because there is a stone or stones blocking the Hartmann's pouch or the spiral valve, which is a valve between mucosal valve between the gallbladder and the cystic duct. So it is blocked. So the gallbladder is distended. What I normally do in that situation is to see this is what we call a trial dissection. I haven't made up my mind for lap colis yet. This is a trial dissection. The trial, trial dissection, what I normally do, if it's tension, I will not go on trying to uh, pick this up because it's, it's fruitless and you might make a perforation. What I do is I use that suction needle which the VOG is often used for suction of the, the, the ovarian cyst. And I put it to the one of the ports. The, 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 most of the time it's a lat, the, 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 the dissecting port onto it. And fix that onto the sucker and make a puncture at the fundus area so that we can use that same area to grasp again and suck the gallbladder, it will suck it out. And you'll be surprised that that makes life very easy. Now, if you can actually hold the gallbladder without sucking, that would be better than suction because suction has advantages and disadvantages also. Why do I say that? If you can actually grasp the gallbladder without suction, the anatomy becomes fairly clear and that will help you to peel off the omentum or the duodenum uh, very, very gently. Now that peeling off part has to be very careful. Now, day before yesterday, I did a lap cole for a hot gallbladder. Now there, that patient had five days. And that one, I could hold the gallbladder with some difficulty and very gently using the, 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 the dissecting forceps, Maryland, without holding the tissue in front of me by bluntly, gently wiping with the backside of the Maryland forcep, I could gently see whether it will peel off. And the, the duodenum was beautifully peeling off. I was not actually pulling it. I was allowing it to fall almost. Very, very gently, duodenum slowly, slowly went down. Now, that is because that patient had the cholecystitis within five days, exactly five days on the day I operated. Now, after about seven days or ten days, that, that, that will not happen that way. When you find that it's not peeling off, if you think that it is a likely a duodenum, I think a lot of surgeons will do it in a different way. I'm telling my practice. I will not proceed with that case. I will make a small incision and do a subtotal cholecystitis. Under direct vision, it's much easier. Not that you can't do it, you can, but it is that rigidity of that ad adhesion or attachment of the duodenum onto that gallbladder area, which actually I'm very, very wary of, because making a whole, and remember that, that the duodenum is also inflamed because it's pericholecystitis, which is spreading onto the duodenum. And in that area, I personally, in my practice, I open it. I, I'm sure a lot of surgeons may not agree, senior surgeons, uh, they will dissect it to see whether they can get a plane. If I find, if I find and in my hands that I, I find it difficult to uh, get a plane safely, then that's the time I make a decision because I am very scared, scared of the duodenum. Duodenal injury is a disaster, not anything else, duodenal injury. So in that case, I probably will open it up. After opening up, I would, what I would do is, I would grasp the gallbladder and under direct vision gently get the momentum off, then having a good look at the, gall, the duodenum and see whether I can get it into the plane of the gallbladder and try to push it down. If it's still difficult, if it's still difficult, what I will do, I'll, I'll plan for a subtotal cholecystectomy. If I find that the whole thing is too stuck, I will open the gallbladder, suck out the secretions, remove the gall, gallstones and divide, remove the gallbladder to that extent that I can remove and I close it with interrupted sutures. Remember in the laparoscopic cholecystectomy, you don't have to remove a, every cell of a gallbladder. The problem is obstruction and the stones. And you leave an area where unlikely that stones are formed again. That's your objective. Not to, not to go in to remove the every piece of gallbladder and getting in trouble by heading towards, uh, by heading towards uh, stuck Hartman's pouch to the common hepatic duct or to the duodenum. So in that case, that patient very easily will go home a few days. 
maybe a day, extra day or two after open surgery as compared to the open uh, or the, uh, the laparoscopic core system. So don't feel guilty about it. Be happy that you are 100% safe that night, that patient is not going to leak. And that patient is not, you have not done a duodenal injury. So it's very easy. And later only you realize that that type of approach makes life very easy for you as well. All you need is one duodenal injury and you will suffer for the rest of your life. So it's just not worth it. Surgery is about happiness to you as well as to the patient and you want to have unnecessary stress on that. So make that decision. That's why it's right at the beginning so decision making is very important for you to make that, uh, to, to plan your thing. So now going back on the steps. So once you visualize the area, inflamed gallbladder, uh, might be contracted towards the medial path close in the calloused angle to that extent and uh, you have managed to position the patient well, you managed to get the transverse colon and hip reflexure down a bit, you managed to get uh, momentum down with a little bit of bleeding of course, and that you are conscious about your duodenum. Now what I normally do at this stage, this is my practice, is that I lift the gallbladder upwards by lifting my uh, grasp in the, infant, the hardness pouch, and make a small peritoneal opening in the posterior lateral area. And then next thing I do is, I use my, my sucker and the irrigator, saline. I put that and I apply normal saline under a bit of pressure. And that will track into that space. And I resist the temptation of proceeding just immediately. I wait for a few seconds, maybe about 10 seconds allowing that saline which went under there, under pressure, to get into those tracks and form a workable plane. And you will be surprised if you wait, you will develop that plane. But remember that you don't know where the infundibular is to junction. So it is better to go a bit high rather than low, but depending on that particular case. Now, once you do that, with the traction medially, laterally, upwards and downwards, you might get some idea about safe area of the, 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 the hardness pouch medium. You might be able to see the node in these patients more than the others because node gets inflamed because of the infection. Pericholecystitis and node is a first relay station, nodes is quite big. Remember the blood vessels are there more in the node on that type of because it's the inflamed node. So medial to that, the lateral to that node, make a small incision in the diaphragm. Remember that your cystic duct artery might be anywhere because of the adhesions. And then do the same thing by sending that irrigation fluid, normal saline. And once you do that, you'll be surprised that life becomes a bit easier because it becomes a little mobile. And when you lift upwards and downwards, you can start seeing the plane. Then most of the time, there are no big blood vessels laterally. I will use what we call the hydro dissection, that is, using the saline slowly inferolaterally to dissect. Posterior anteromedial, you have to be a little bit careful because you remember that you have not seen the cystic artery. So, get into that anterior plane and get some sort of workable space. And it is mostly in my practice, it's a hydro dissection till I start seeing the cystic artery. Now, remember in some patients cystic artery might be thrombus because of the pericholecystitis. But in some patients you might see a big cystic artery also. You always imagine that there is going to be a big cystic artery. And whenever you use a diatomy, if there is a bit of bleeding, you stop, suck it and diatomize that little bit and then proceed. Don't go on doing using water when there is bleeding all the time. Wash it, get the control and be very, very slow on that. Once you do that, after a few minutes, with more and more fluid going in, you'll be surprised that the gallbladder becomes fairly mobile. And then, of course, you try to demonstrate the artery first. Try your level base to clip the artery and divide before you do the cystic duct. Otherwise, if you divide cystic duct and lift it up, the artery might get evulsed, especially in a patient with acute cholecystitis. So be conscious about it. If the artery gets evulsed, it's a big problem for you. And after that, uh, you know, you might have to open up rather than putting blind diatomy and getting into trouble with the bile duct. So, so avoid that. Prevention of that is the most important part and you go ahead with it. And most of the time you can get the same structure which, uh, uh, which I described in the first part of this uh, discussion. Now, there are certain other issues. 
the, the common issue I find is that a fairly big stone or multiple stones embedded in the Hartman's pouch. Hartman's pouch rotating medially and with the inflammatory addition narrowing or obliterating the calorie triangle and worse off getting stuck to the common hepatic duct which you can't see it. Now there I think hydrodissection is very important. Despite the hydrodissection medial tissue between what you perceive as the infundibular cystic duct junction medially and the area you are suspecting the common hepatic duct to be, if you are not sure by checking anteriorly and posteriorly, still you are not 100% sure, I will not take a risk and divide that. This is one of the common risk surgeons take, that inflamed tissue. If you really want to proceed, you can proceed on the gallbladder wall as much as possible. Still we don't know, still might be stuck to the, uh, uh, to the common hepatic duct. If at my experience I feel that I am not happy, I am not happy. If I am not happy, next move I am taking a risk to my patient's safety. I think it's better to open up that situation. Of course, we can discuss in a big way, you know, you do this, you do that, you do the, divide this and try to mobilize further. That's all textbook says. You can read and get all that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just at that particular time, the risk-taking component. If you, in your mind, at that particular time, with this particular patient, with this much of inflammation, not sure, that not sure part has to be transmitted to the patient. See that if it's your sister with your university visit. You will not. So because in that case you will do the same thing for the patient. So that's the area. The common hepatic, the, 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 the Hartman's pouch with a stone which is embedded. I'm not talking about Mirisit syndrome. It might be Mirisit, but Mirisit are rare. It's not common. It's two to three percent. It's much rare. Occasionally once a year you might see. It's not common. But it's not the Mirisit. The whole thing is stuck there. So when you try to dissect it, uh, but the, the common hepatic duct might be as more closer than what we ever imagined. I can remember uh, a couple of weeks ago we did a gallbladder, another surgeon was assisting me, and we couldn't find the cystic duct, and we assumed that this is a cystic duct, so I divided well away from it into a bit of fibrosis, and that was very small cystic duct, which we initially thought is a small artery. So, I mean, anatomy might be very, very variable in some patients, so you have to be very careful. But Every step, you have to be away from the bile duct. If there is any suspicion of that, then textbook will describe, your colleagues will say, I, I did this and that and that type of thing. You would have done it, you would have been okay, but still, risk-taking behavior is something which you must avoid at all costs in the operational levels of the system. So once you do that, you can go ahead with it. Most of the time with the hydrodissection, it might be surprisingly easy, provided you be paranoid about the medial part of the gallbladder, supramedial part of the gallbladder, the common hepatic duct abnormally coming close to it, still inflamed cystic artery, especially because of the big stone there. Now, once you do that, then of course, the rest might be easy. Now, at any stage of this operation, like I described this tissue in the medial side, if there is a doubt, just do a, uh, actually it would not necessarily be a big cholecystectomy incision because you know exactly where the gallbladder is. You have mobilized the gallbladder. It's a matter of taking this safely without taking a risk. Make a small incision and go there. Some surgeons will say that, why don't you divide the gall gallbladder with the diatomy and try to suture it. You can do that, not that you can't. It depends you know, on your experience or what you want. Uh, in my practice, I don't try to do that. I think if I'm unhappy, I will just make a small incision, open it and finish the operation that way. And I have already discussed with the, that with the patient before. So that is, but sometimes they will use it. They might be able to use the harmonic scalpel and divide the gallbladder. Not that it cannot be done. I'm not, I'm not denouncing that. You can, provided you're quite happy in what you do. You must be happy and confident in that part of the operation. If you're unhappy, don't do that. Just open it and sort it out that way because you'll be very happy. I can tell you, you'll always be happy. You might be unhappy uh, later if you have done the other one. 
in some patients, not in every patient. Most of them you can get away, but not necessarily in every patient. Right. Fall in stones into the uh, gallbladder bed. That can happen. That happens to all of us. Not happens commonly, but it can. But number one, prevent it as much as possible because it's a real mess to pick the stones up, especially the small stones. Tiny stones, don't waste time on it. That's not going to cause any problem. But if it's a big stone, it will definitely cause a problem. Clips, falling clips will not cause problems. Falling big stone can cause a big problem because it gets infected and the small ball gets wrapped around it and may, might develop a fistula there or a transverse colon or the duodenum or the stomach, all that. So falling stones, big stones, you have to take it out. You get into trouble because these infected stones and then you will end up by having small bowel getting wrapped and creating fistulas and a lot of problems post-operatively. So try to remove all, all the stones. And there, the danger is, stones might go into the small bowel area, which is difficult. So if that is the case, most of them will lift the foot end up again a little bit. Then it gets stuck in the subhepatic area, gently sucking and grasp the stone with the crocodile. And while, don't crush it, hold it and Either you have a bag, you put it into the bag. But remember, most of the government hospitals don't have bags. The private sector bag is as much as 10,000 rupees or 9,500. I checked it a few days ago. So that's a lot of money. So if one or two stones don't use a bag, most of the time what I would suggest is you hold the stone with your crocodile forceps and get it close to the, uh, your 10 millimeter port epigastric and take the whole port out. Don't try to pull the stone into the port. And the, 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 the stone will come up without any problem. But don't crush it, otherwise you will crush and get in trouble. So maybe two stones you might be able to remove that, or one, a couple of big stones. Small stones, wash it and you might be able to suck it out as well. But try to keep the stones in the subhepatic area rather than into the small bowel. Remember that the patient's head end is up, so you have to be conscious about it. Fluid will go up. And do a very good thorough irrigation with normal saline, at least a liter. You put it and suck it out. But in elderly, you have to be careful because this fluid gets absorbed. So we discuss the anesthetics about the fluid, uh, the rate of fluid in infusion post-operatively as well, because they can go into heart failure. Be conscious about to put in too much uh, normal saline into the basement cavity as well in elderly. So that is removing the stones. So uh, then after that, of course, make sure I always put my hand my finger into the epigastric port where I normally take my gallbladder out. That's some people take it to the umbilical port, but most of the time in my practice I take it to the epigastric port. I put my finger again and make sure that I haven't lost any clips there because if there's a clip you get a sinus. So get a general practice of that and clean it nicely and close the wound and you'll be fine on that. So that's a form of difficult cholecystectomy. So going back on what I told you, Number one, decision making. Is it going to be a difficult polycystectomy or not? It depends on your expertise, your experience, your risk taking behavior, and your patient's pathology. And the anatomy as well, but mostly a pathology than the anatomy. Anatomy is generally not as bad as what the anatomical textbooks describe. Secondly, every step, you have to be careful and make sure that you're paranoid about doing this. Don't feel bad in converting lab colis into open colis. Never feel bad. You will never regret. You will definitely at some stage going to regret if you don't do that. So you don't depend on textbook description or the research description or percentage or conversion rate. What matters is safety. The safety of your patient overrides all other concerns in today's practice. It's extremely important that you be conscious about it. And then once you irrigate nicely, I normally make sure that subhepatic space is empty of fluids. Uh, and also the suprahepatic space um, and make sure that you drain it and that's where we normally wash as you already know because you are, you are doing laparoscopy polycystectomies and you know that but subhepatic also empty it nicely. I rarely put drains into that uh, and I normally put three clips into the cystic duct. Now why cystic duct? Clipping was a suturing and you have LT300 clips, you have LT400 clips, you have the vascular clips Hemoclips, that is hemoclips locking, uh, and you can suture it. Out of it, most of the time, uh, I will use in the wide cystic duct LT400, 
and if there is still doubt about it, I'll put one or two hemoglyphs. And hemoglyphs are very important that make sure that you see the other end, you must get that click, otherwise it's not, it's not good to work. Don't depend too much about the hemoglyphs also. And when you put the clips, the most medial clip towards the bile duct, you mustn't push it, the, you mustn't compress it too much. Because in case if you become very sort of a rigid and slight tear, remember that is the, the clip which is close to the bile duct. There's a possibility of ischemic necrosis and leakage. So that clip has to be applied with very gentle, with mm -hmm. gentleness and care. And then the second and the third and the other one. So these are small tricks of the trade and uh, uh, this might help you to get out of the difficult situations. And as I mentioned to you earlier, this patient needs painkillers also. We use a lot of surgeons who diclomenex sodium suppositories, which is very, very useful. And uh, I normally give another one uh, later on in the evening. And next day morning, one suppository and going home. And the patient is usually comfortable. Most of the time when you go to see the patient, patients are already ready, dressed up to go home. That means patient's mindset is to go home. Obviously, there is nothing significant going on inside the tummy cavity. So these are general observations. And uh, I think if you practice that, never regret opening a patient before causing injury is my last comment. Thank you.